Welcome, everybody. This morning, we heard an extraordinarily inspiring panel from four women who all have been fighting in their own way um, against um, similar forces, I think we can say, within the UK and with a broadly similar outlook. The panel that we're going to, um, that I'd like to introduce you to today, to, at this time, is very, very different. We're going to listen to four speakers from four different continents. Each of them um, will be speaking in a personal capacity, not representing any party or group, um, and they will all be speaking about their personal experiences fighting homophobia within their own country. They may very well disagree with some of the positions of LGB Alliance. They may very well disagree with each other. And that is okay. That is okay to disagree as long as we speak to each other respectfully. And that is what we stand for. So I would like to introduce to you, I think they're hiding somewhere, first, Faika El Nagashi. Is she here? <laughs> Faika is an openly lesbian Austrian politician and a lifelong political activist. As a member of the Green Party, which is currently in government coalition in Austria, um, she is one of the very few, if not the only, um, gender critical um, politician on the left in the whole of Europe. So it's an extraordinary thing that we. I am. <laughs> we are thrilled to have her with us today. Um, she has been um, a human rights act uh, advocate with civil society organizations for more than 20 years, including for the rights of migrant women and LGBT organizations and anti-racism initiatives. And as many of you will know, she was recently barred from attending a lesbian conference which um, was organized by a, an organization that she herself had um, been active in for many, many years. And it is a scandal. Um, Anyway, welcome, Fika. So happy to have you here. And now I'd like to introduce you to Isaac Mugisha. <laughs> Isaac is a celebrated um, African LGBTQ plus rights activist. He has dedicated his life to ensure LGBTQ plus activists have access to essential services, justice, and information in Uganda. He has led Pride Uganda as a coordinator since 2016. Under his leadership, coordination and community participation have increased in spite of frequent interruptions by police. As you know, of course, homosexuality is illegal in Uganda. <coughs> Since 2021, he's been the co-chair of uh, Alternate Mail for the Pan-African ILGA, and this is a network of all um, LGBTQ plus organizations on the African continent. Isaac currently works for the Safety and Security Focal Point for Uganda Key Populations Consortium. His vision is to live in a Uganda, which is currently a dictatorship, a Uganda that respects human rights for all. Welcome, Isaac. <laughs> and now I'd like to introduce to you Vaishnavi Sundar. <laughs> Vaishnavi, a self-taught filmmaker, writer and women's rights activist from the south of India. India, a huge country that we can hardly comprehend the complexity of with so many different languages and cultures and a huge rural population, as um, has Uganda, of course. Her extraordinary four-part um, video documentary, Dysphoric, has helped many people understand why young women 
especially lesbians, are trying to escape from womanhood. Uh, she works in a country that is um, ostensibly a democracy, but uh, whose current PM um, has what we, we could call maybe um, dictatorial tendencies. <laughs> and now I hope, I hope to be able to introduce, yes, Derek Turner. <laughs> Derek Turner is um, uh, that rare person, um, an American um, from the Democratic Party, originally from the Democratic Party, who is very concerned about the issues that concern us here. He is a technologist with a history working um, in the Democratic Party. As an activist, he's a fierce advocate for free expression and um, also previously worked at the ACLU, uh, many of you will know the ACLU used to be about civil liberties and these days has turned in a rather peculiar direction. You may have questions about that. He has fought for racial justice and marriage equality and he's currently focused on reforming the two-party system in the US, which doesn't seem to be working all that well. Um, yes, there are other places where it's not working all that well. I won't go into that. Um, he's, he's extremely worried about um, child transition, which is being promoted by some very key figures in the current administration. Welcome, Derek. Okay, so I would like to start by asking each of our panelists to describe their own experiences um, in this area, in fighting homophobia, for fighting for LGB rights, and I'd like to start off with FICA. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for having me here. And also, I would really like to start by saying how moved I am to be here and have been since I arrived. I want to congratulate the organizers and all of you for what you have managed to create here. It is an exceptional space. I will refer mainly to my local context. I, I live in Austria, um, but I will um, situate my input not so much geographically, but ideologically in terms of the situation of lesbian women and how we are caught between a rock and a hard place. I believe that we do need self-determination, self-expression and self-representation as lesbians in the current time of multiple crises, in which there are ideological movements that are clashing with each other over who belongs to a community and who does not, and in what place, role, and function. And as most of the time, this kind of, some call it cultural war, is being fought over the lives, the bodies, and the realities of women. I live in Austria, where probably a lot of you also will know there is a comparatively high level of social acceptance towards lesbians and gays and good legal provisions, including same-sex partnerships, marriage and adoption rights. Um, but access to these um, legal rights is restricted first and foremost by citizenship and Austria has one of the harshest laws regarding naturalization in Europe. For migrants, and I myself have a migrant background, refugees and people from black and POC, people of color communities, the homophobia that they experience is exacerbated by racism and discrimination, perpetuated also by political parties in government. It is on an institutional and structural level as well as often by homophobia from within their own diaspora or migrant communities. And then there is also a reality of homophobia in Austria, of physical attacks, of discrimination, and of the demonization of LGBTIQ people, communities, by far-right parties and groups who at the same time and in the same ideological line attack Muslims and migrants and refugees as part of what is called their anti-gender ideology. It has a specific place for everyone, especially for women, 
as their role as obedient wives and mothers is seen as essential for the future of what they construct as their nation. So this is the rock. It is the politics of Orban and Putin and Kaczynski and Erdogan and Kadyrov. They propagate anti-gender ideology and they declare a cultural war to save the West and in other contexts their own uh, constructions and Christianity or Islam from invasion and from decline. They perse persecute, they punish, they ban, and they endanger the lives of those who do not conform to their racist, nationalist, sexist, and religious fundamentalist agenda. And then there is a hard place. The dogmas of mainstream LGBTIQ activism that demand unchallenged, and lo unchallenged loyalty and commitment from their following and have enlisted human rights institutions, universities, as we've heard in the first panel, also the media, political parties and donors into their service. They close rank and no debate or dissent is allowed. If you transgress, if you question, you will be made a traitor. And recently, I began addressing some of the issues that I take with the way mainstream LGBTIQ activism has changed and what it has now become. I spoke about conflicts of interest that cannot be addressed, about linguistic turns that are being promoted as progressive, the use of neo-pronouns, binary constructions such as cis and trans, the increased reluctance to say woman, and about the absolute lack of spaces that lesbians can create and inhabit without asterisks, without explanation, without accusations. When I asked my questions in public, I was met with a storm of outrage. I was compared to Putin and Orban and accused of fueling their agenda and of promoting hate and violence towards marginalized people. As a lesbian woman, I had lost any right to dissent, to talk in public, to my beliefs and to my self-determination. And as you know, I'm not alone with this experience. I was in Hungary recently, and I met with local gender-critical feminists who organize and work without any institutional or financial support. They are not seen, their voices are dismissed, it is as if they do not legitimately exist at all. There are only two sides in this arena, one conservative, the other one, progressive misogyny. And there is no space for us, unless we create it. We have to come into existence, and we have to build our spaces. And I suggest, and that is of course up for discussion, and I hope we will have discussion, to do this in transnational alliances across borders and regions. It is not a national um, phenomenon or issue. With true intersectionality, that includes intergenerational exchange and dialogue, and through care for each other, and a resilient and sustainable activism. When I was in Hungary, I asked the feminist activists how they knew of each other. It was mainly through social media that they made the connections, but one of them, who left no trace on social media through likes or shares, she said, I was invisible, but still you saw me. So let's be visible, but most of all, let's see each other. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vika. I think um, being caught between a rock and a hard place is a very good description of the way that so many of us have felt over the past several years. And I'm particularly interested, and I hope we will come back to this later, um, about your view of intergenerational dialogue, because so much of what we're seeing now is a, a different perspective um, among young people, especially pe young people who've gone to university, and uh, not so much, I think, among young people who have not gone to university, I might be wrong about that, and um, older people. 
Um, so let's come back to this interge intergenerational idea later. Um, now I'd like to hear from Isaac. Uh, thank you so much. Um, it's always hard to speak after someone great <laughs> like Freika, <laughs> but I'll try to take it up. Um, I bring you greetings from Uganda. Uh, we normally call Uganda the land of milk and honey, and of course the pearl of Africa. So greetings from Uganda. Uh, my name is Isaac Mugisha. Thank you. Uh, my name is Isaac Mugisha, once again, uh, I'm an LGBTI plus uh, human and health rights activist for the last 12 years. Um, I would like to also emphasize that we are all here from different contexts and uh, we view our work differently. I come from a community, from an environment where we are all struggling to survive. We struggle to live and so we need each other where I come from. I represent the marginalized from all angles, but I'm not an expert of all issues, uh, but I appreciate uh, the LGB Alliance for bringing us together irrespective of our different views, to dialogue, and which I think is the important way for us to move forward. Um, in my context where I come from, um, LGBT persons uh, uh, struggle to live, to exist, to evolve, to develop, to work, and has become more aggressive and hostile towards um, our survival. There's still strong resistance by societies and uh, social institutions that seek to maintain the status quo and prevent changes on a wide range of issues, particularly about uh, the body politics, uh, body autonomy, freedom and dignity, sexuality and gender. And these often result into violations against uh, communities, but also mostly to activists like myself. Um, we have not survived um, uh, um, violations like, uh, like assaults, murder, uh, arrests and detention, torture and, 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 and inhuman and degrading treatment, even when you're arrested in custody and, you know, by authorities that are meant to protect you. These are the daily realities of an LGBTI plus person uh, where I come from. And this happened in both private and public spaces, uh, perpetrated by the state, uh, non-state actors including family members, uh, community or religious leaders, healthcare professionals, employers, co-workers, education system, uh, landlords, and other duty bearers. Criminalization and lack of legal protection leave LGBTI plus persons uh, highly vulnerable and without access, proper recourse or redress. Uh, oppressive laws also perpetrate societal prejudice, uh, fueling harassment, discrimination, and violence, and these violations are often uh, underreported and rarely investigated and, and prosecuted, uh, leading to impunity and a lack of justice and support for the victims. Uh, human rights defenders, uh, organizations combating these violations are frequently perse uh, persecuted and face restrictions in these activities. Um, uh, while there's uh, also a broader shrinking civic space for, uh, uh, for uniting, for meeting, for, uh, for, for uh, speech, uh, and this really uh, dis appropriately uh, uh, affects uh, access to services that are really uh, human and, 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 and right. So uh, in addition to the illegality of the work, uh, which makes it really impossible for LGBT organizations to register, making most of us and most, most organizations really depend on international aid uh, and, and, and depend on support uh, through donations. This exposes most organizations to multi-tiered uh, threats, vulnerabilities, hence no work being done. I'll give you uh, like examples of really what has happened in the, in the, in the past. Um, we, uh, we recently had um, two members of the Sexual Minorities Uganda, which is the umbrella organization for LGBT organizations in Uganda. These um, two staff were really arrested um, on, um, so they went to police to report a case of violence that happened, and they were instead arrested, that they're promoting homosexuality. So you imagine how you wake up to report a case of violence that happened to you, uh, but when you get to the police, they, in they instead detain you saying you're promoting homosexuality. So they don't even listen to the case you're reporting. Um, we also uh, recently had about 20, um, uh, uh, 20 community members were arrested at the shelter. Uh, you know, this is 
a shelter for the homeless. It's, it's also a hard conversation to say a country like Uganda has a shelter for homeless LGBT people when LGBT people are not allowed. But um, so what the police does is target such shelters and arrest whoever is there and say, you know, they're promoting human trafficking, they're uh, uh, recording pornography in the shelters. And these are young people of, you know, between 19 and 22. They're all arrested and taken to prison, prisons which are not supportive. And uh, the torture that happens in such, um, uh, 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 in such uh, uh, state, in such location is also what I wouldn't want to describe now. Um, there's also what I would call the new, the new current strategy that the opposition is using to uh, really target LGBT people, uh, whereby they take advantage of the current economic situation of the young LGBT persons, promise them funding and promise them good life, and use them to spread hate through media, churches, and other, other public domains. And uh, it's the current uh, uh, threat that the community is going through right now. Um, so the opposition groups are getting LGBT and giving them money to go and go in, ch in churches or in media and say that they were recruited into homosexuality, that they were promised, they were given money to shoot pornography. And so uh, from the public eye and from the public domain, it sounds like, you know, uh, there's a lot of promotion going on that organizations are doing. And we've seen uh, in June just this year, uh, sexual minorities in Uganda was, uh, was stopped, but the registration was withdrawn by the government of Uganda on these allegations of what the opposition is doing currently. So um, there's so many organizations that are now targeted. Uh, actually, I would say almost each organization that is doing LGB work around LGBT people, uh, uh, persons has been uh, cautioned and almost all uh, registrations are being withdrawn currently. So the space is really, um, uh, going down, and that's why uh, for me, I was like, you know, uh, what we need to talk about right now and what the situation for Uganda is, how do we unite, how do we work together, but how do we dialogue, even when there's things within the movement that still affect us, even when organizing is still hard within the movement, even when there are internal issues that we need to talk about, but how do we still stay in touch with each other? And as someone who organizes event uh, pride in Uganda, I, I, I always, you know, want to hear each and every voice, you know, what, what do we think? What is the problem? How do we, um, how do we address it? And um, the current past, you know, we've been having a lot of friction happening within even, you know, uh, within the movement of, you know, that these groups, there's this group, there's this group, but how do we all really make sure we put our points forward and we don't hurt each other? Well, yeah, thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Isaac, and I think it's really quite um, uh, a, a, an extraordinary moment for us all to realize how difficult it must be to be fighting for LGBT rights in Uganda, and it's just amazing what you're doing, Isaac. Thank you very much. And now I'd like to um, ask Vaishnavi to give us her account. I'm just going to read my speech. There are 447 languages spoken in India, thousands of dialects, so many unique cultures, customs, religions, region, and a division most devious of all, caste. One common thread that connects all Indian women despite the differences is the misogyny we face. Homophobia is rampant, male violence against women is at an all-time high, conviction rate at an alarming low. With that landscape in mind, picture this. In 2018, a large group of anxious people waited outside the Supreme Court for the verdict on whether the archaic sodomy law, Section 377, was going to be upheld or not. The law was struck down, making same-sex attraction no longer a criminal offense. The whole country rejoiced. Let me... Let me remind you that the world's largest democracy decriminalized homosexuality only four years ago. The verdict bears witness to the unspeakable crimes that same-sex attracted women have faced and continue to face in this country. In rural West Bengal, two women killed themselves for not being able to call themselves lovers, and their bodies were retrieved from a field. The bodies of these women, Swapna and Sucheta, remained unclaimed in a morgue. They were burned together on a pyre with nobody to mourn. Several women have faced the same fate. 
There are thousands of young lesbians subjected to corrective rape, and often these are done by brothers, fathers, and uncles. They are never reported because police consider these trivial crimes. Lesbians are sent to be cured at the hands of a godman who further abused them, forced into marriage and pregnancy, faced with violence and relentless abuse. India is 70% rural, and the life of a lesbian in some remote village, if she dares to speak, up out, speak out about this, is brutality and death. Lesbian women have been hanged in public view to teach them a lesson, and this sends shockwaves down uh, the spine of anybody who, else, who, who, else might, who also might be same-sex attracted. It's hard enough to be female in India, a country where a woman is raped every hour. Imagine being a lesbian in this painfully rigid, heteropatriarchal society. Now imagine being one in a village governed by arrogant, misogynist, entitled men who marry multiple women to fetch water for their family during drought. Sure, lesbians and bisexual women in metro cities have the freedom to be open about their sexuality, but a different form of lesbian erasure has taken over the conversation here. Gender ideology has successfully colonized schools, colleges, media, law, corporates, and politics. There's barely any representation of same-sex attracted women when they are not pornified, called all sorts of bizarre postmodern labels, or when men claim the title. Sexual violence, lesbophobia, misogyny, and compulsory heterosexuality are driving young lesbians towards the gender identity conveyor belt, where girls as young as 13 are being asked to wear binders by therapists, and parents are vilified for intervening. Adults living in the city from poor economic class converge in the same path, too. Lesbians go down the gender identity rabbit hole to become desirable to other women in the only way they know how, as a man. Bisexual women's situation isn't all that different either. It is also considered a disease warranting a cure. Anjana Harish, a 21-year-old bisexual woman from Kerala, posted a video of her solitary confinement experience inside a mental health center because her family wanted to cure her. This was days before she killed herself. So many bisexual women never speak about their same-sex attraction. Many marry, have children, and when their marriage ends for whatever reason, decide to cohabit with their female friends. In the cities, some bisexual women openly talk about it on their social media. There's a stand-up comic who makes hilarious sketches, which is available online. Some mumble about it at a conference, and some never speak about it at all. But all of these women face some form of social taboo nevertheless. During the fourth anniversary of Section 377 strike down, Indian media fervently demanded that conversion therapy should not just be treated as a professional misconduct, but be made illegal. I completely agree. But in a country where same-sex attraction is treated as a disease and gender identity is offered as a cure, we need to speculate whether all forms of lesbian erasure is taken into account. In India, there is no plausible middle ground one could take on matters concerning homosexuality. Gender identity in conversations revolving the rights of LGB is a non sequitur. A male is not female. Same-sex attraction is not transphobic. Men should not have access to women-only spaces, especially where women-only spaces are a rarity in India to begin with. And regardless of how you identify, men are not entitled to date lesbians. These are non-negotiables. In, in, closing, in closing, I want to say, my activism in India is not to make anyone comfortable at the cost of women's basic liberty, but my advocacy comes at a huge cost to me. As post-colonial India is visited by a new missionary, government and aided organizations are scoping for the gullibles and the greedy to recruit. And every method they adopt is a template imported from the West. So if we were to go by the West's example, the number of botched surgeries and regret are going to skyrocket in a matter of few years. And unlike here, the Indian criminal justice system wouldn't even consider this grave enough to investigate. So, when the, West, so the West's approach to tackle gender identity industry must remember the women of the global South too, because back home, we will still be paying the price for this long after the world has moved on to a new form of misogyny. So what do I plan to do? Through my films, writing, activism, film festivals, through my film community, and several such means, I hope to amplify the voices and stories of lesbian and bisexual women by bringing to light the everyday stories of women who quite simply love women. 
In my effort to tackle this gender monster, I hope I can, to a small extent, prevent women from fleeing womanhood like a house on fire. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Vaishnavi. And those last words that she spoke um, come from um, uh, her, her amazing um, documentary um, video, um, a Dysphoric, which if you haven't seen yet, um, I really advise everyone to see. An, an interesting word there that she used, I think, was the word missionary, the new missionaries. It's quite, uh, uh, an, uh, has quite an unpleasant sound to it, and that's another thing that we might want to come back to. Um, the, what are we importing to um, developing countries um, from the so-called developed world? And now I would like to hear from Derek. Thank you so much. Uh, it's an honor to be amongst the other members of this panel. Um, I'm happy to be here. So it's really hard to overstate how intense the political conflict is in the United States right now. The polarization is so extreme. The, the hatred and distrust uh, is quite frightening. Um, I feel like we're living through a cold civil war. And uh, gainless mean people are caught in the middle of the crossfire. So. You know, we haven't had political violence yet. I predict in 2024, we probably will. We'll probably have a disputed presidential election. Uh, and the animosity is, is, uh, is scary. So I want to talk a little bit about what's happening on the Republican side, what's happening on the Democratic side, um, and then abortion issues, which uh, you can't talk about US politics right now without thinking about abortion, uh, since the right to an abortion has been overturned uh, since June. Uh, and that's actually quite connected to marriage equality. So on the Republican side, you have things like uh, what's called commonly the don't say gay bill. Uh, in the state of Florida, they passed a bill, it's actually called the parental rights and education bill. It, it uh, disallows discussing gender identity or sexual orientation in grades uh, kindergarten through third, which is uh, for kids under nine or 10 years old. And the story of that bill in the national media is mostly about gay people, but the origin of the bill is actually from when a family in Florida, the Little John family, their daughter was socially transitioned in secret in her public school, which is what we call a government-funded school. And of course that's terribly abusive. No one who is a stranger to the family should be making that decision, and it should never be kept secret from parents. So, you know, because, because the Republican legislature of Florida is stupid and bad at writing bills, they threw in sexual orientation, and as a result, that became the issue, when uh, really it was about the indoctrination of kids in schools, about gender identity and whether their body might be wrong. So. That story has become a major factor uh, on the Republican side. And there's other ways in which uh, Republicans are sort of reacting against the movement uh, for gay rights and gender, or, uh, gender identity. Uh, we have elections coming up in three weeks uh, for Congress. So we call them the midterms because it's partway through the presidential term. Uh, many of the Republican ads that you're seeing on TV are about gender identity and sexual orientation are conflated in those, in those ads. <laughs> For instance, in the state of uh, Pennsylvania, the governor's race is, is really important and that's become a dominant story there. So on the Republican side, you have Re Republicans on the offensive. Um, on the Democratic side, uh, yeah, I feel rather betrayed that the Democratic Party has abandoned gay and lesbian teenagers. Uh, we have figures in the Biden administration like Rachel Levine, who is, uh, is familiar to some of you, uh, many of you. Uh, she's the Assistant Secretary for Health. I disagree. I, I believe it's an important courtesy to call people by the pronoun, pronoun they prefer. But, uh, this is what we call respectful disagreement, okay? Um, but Rachel Levine is 
bad for gay and lesbian teenagers because she is a source of misinformation and junk science, and she's the voice of the administration. So she says things like puberty blockers are safe and re reversible, which of course they're not. She says that youth gender transition is based on decades of research and well-established medical practice. Even if you agree with her, those are just factually untrue things to say. So, you know, she really is a discredit to her own side and she needs to be fired. Biden needs to fire Rachel Levine. Um, there are other trans women who have a much more evidence-based approach to youth gender medicine. Uh, Erica Anderson is one such figure. So if for identity politics re reasons they want to replace her with another trans woman, they could do a lot better. And so on the Republican side, you have you know, an attack on the Democratic side, you have uh, abandonment and... Uh, 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 and betrayal. Um, and then the, uh, the third story is uh, abortion, right? So in, in June, the right to an abortion, which had been law in the United States for about 50 years, was overturned by the conservative majority on the US Supreme Court. The basis for the right to abortion comes from the 14th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, which guarantees equal protection and due process. And the legal theory of substantive due process encompasses ideas of autonomy and privacy, and that's the way that the Supreme Court has always uh, expanded rights. Based on, based on that uh, substantive due process, uh, abortion became uh, protected. Uh, based on that, interracial marriage became protected. Based on that, same-sex marriage became protected. And so now that the Supreme Court is eroding substantive due process rights, people are concerned that maybe marriage equality is in danger. Uh, if we're interested in sort of the inside story, you know, I've consulted with some friends who are constitutional law experts, and uh, they think that the, the threat is low because, number one, public approval for same-sex marriage is rather high. It's 71%. Uh, it's been climbing steadily year by year. Um, and number two, there's reasons why the Republican, why conservatives care about substantive due process also. That's also the basis for being able to uh, control your child's education or to uh, be able to reject medical treatments that you don't want. So most of the Supreme Court wants to preserve that. Uh, probably two justices, maybe uh, Clarence Thomas, maybe Samuel Alito, uh, want to get rid of substantive due process entirely. So in, the, in Congress, we had an effort to pass marriage equality legislatively, and that very nearly passed, but not quite. So um, this, the story of marriage equality has been an amazing transformation. You know, starting in 2004, it was in part the basis for George W. Bush being reelected. He advocated for a constitutional amendment against marriage equality. And then in 2015, we won that right nationally. So, um, you know, it's an issue that's important to all of us, of course. Um, it's potentially under threat, but uh, the threat is probably low. So, um, Democrats are not taking care of gay kids, Republicans are attacking, um, and marriage equality is a a little bit precarious. Well, um, is this? Yeah, thank you so much, Derek. And uh, one of the things that um, I might want to come back to if we have time is with what your position is and, um, on what's called court packing, because as you know, the Supreme Court now, um, due to all sorts of um, shenanigans by the Trump administration, is 6-3 um, conservative with quite young justices who were appointed for life, and so that's how Roe, v, uh, Roe got overturned. And court packing would mean um, expanding the number of justices in the Supreme Court, and I don't know if that's a live issue at the moment. 
But um, it is, yeah. Uh, an opponent would call it court packing. We would call it Supreme Court reform. You know, maybe they don't need to be lifetime appointments. Maybe, you yeah. know, uh, this was the downfall of FDR who tried to do the same. But. Anyway, it's 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 an important issue, and um, thank you so much for this um, insight into what it, what it's like to be fighting in the United States at the moment, which is um, so divided in so many ways. Um, I would like to briefly ask each of our panelists. Um, after hearing these extraordinarily diverse stories. I mean, we're, our world has suddenly expanded, hasn't it? I mean, it's just suddenly think, whoa, okay. That is a very, these are four very, very different stories. What do you see as the main, well, you can either focus on the main differences that you've heard or points of similarity. FICA? Um, Thank you. Um, well, I mean, of course, I, I would find more similarity um, in what you've described, uh, Derek, the strong polarization um, in society and also politically uh, that you've described, and I think that's, uh, that's remarkable, and it is um, very problematic. And it is, as, as you also pointed out, not only around one issue, it's a number of, of issues, and this is something that we have to address also politically. What is the future of these political sites the conservatives and, and liberals, and I think you've experiencing uh, some of it here also at the moment. Um, but it is, it is not only in, in, in one national context. And then what happens to the rights of minorities and the rights of women specifically? So, um, Vaishnavi, when you pointed out that women are the ones who are suffering under these conditions, um, regardless of the, the context that you have politically or what is being brought in, um, in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an exporting way and also in a colonial way. And this, this element of, of a, a colonial um, export was also raised by the Hungarian women that I talked with who say that they have this experience not only for Hungary or for their national context, but also broader for Eastern European countries and also moving into Central Asia. So, and then maybe this also relates to, uh, Isaac, the points that you've raised about your situation in Uganda and, and also other aspects of how, what your, the, the, the work that your organization is doing, the, the strategies, the content, but also the financial situation is also so strongly connected to um, um, priorities that are communicated to you through uh, partners and funders that you work with. Thanks very much, Fika. What, Isaac, what, what points of similarity or difference have you noticed from your fellow panelists? Uh, well, uh, for me, it's really uh, from a point of learning uh, on how uh, uh, contexts are really different, but also uh, where the struggle for Uganda is going, because you realize we have so many differences, whereas uh, the rest of the panelists come from uh, countries which don't criminalize homosexuality. Uh, my country does. And uh, so I'm just looking at how how, how did you get where you are? You know, what's, what's the great point to pick from there? But also understanding that uh, structurally things are changing, uh, even from within uh, our own movements that uh, organizing is changing. Uh, there's other groups that are really emerging within, and so we need to really watch out for these and, and, and know how do we um, address them when they come for us. Uh, uh, but also, uh, similarly, is that, you know, we've all come from the same point. We've come from a point of criminalization. And uh, so we need to really learn from each other and see how do we move forward and not fight each other. Yeah. Not fight each other. I think that's something that we can all um, learn from. Um, I think similarities would just be the fact that there are LGB everywhere. You know, just like here, there are LGB in India. Um, the difference is perhaps is just, it's extremely difficult for us to get through a message when you speak 500 something languages. Right? We don't all speak in English and I don't speak 500 Indian languages, I barely speak three. And I find it difficult to get my point of view across just within my state. The difference is just that the enormity of the situation to me seems a lot more out of control in India than it is, uh, say, in the UK, where there is some sort of an organized effort for people to come together to form some form of resistance against the gender identity ideology, which there 
I find it incredibly difficult to get through to some people for them to even agree with me publicly, let alone stand and fight like I do with my face and name out. I think that's the st stark difference that I find. Thank you. Um, Derek. When, so, of course, uh, we all uh, exist, we're, all, we're everywhere. Um, a difference I'm thinking about is the way in which other sort of players in society are getting involved in this issue. Uh, for example, in, in Florida, related to the so-called Don't Say Gay Bill, uh, the Disney Corporation has become a major voice uh, against the bill. Um, the Republican governor of Florida uh, has gone on the attack against Disney um, and tried to remove the sort of legal protections they have to kind of self-govern Disney World. And, and so we have this uh, fracturing of society where everything is left or right, everything is for or against. Um, there are very few sort of neutral parties, very few um, institutions that are not getting sucked in one direction or the other. Thank you very much. I've, I've got some questions here from the audience. Um, and uh, somebody has written very kindly, the international panel is why I came today. It hasn't disappointed. Thank you. Um, Isaac, um, somebody says it's over just over 10 years since Ugandan gay rights activist David Cato was murdered. I hope he is still remembered and his life inspires LGB Ugandans today. Um, well, that's, that's, that's really like one of those uh, low moments that uh, I in Uganda even are present and we celebrate the 26th of January, which is the day when he was murdered. But also his blood is really significant for the movement growth. Uh, because um, it, I mean, it's, symbol, it's symbolic in a way that uh, we all reflect on it and know that the struggle that we are in is for life or death. And so when you see activists on the front line in Uganda, you really um, want to support them in any way to make sure that their lives are safe, but also uh, that, that, you know, the movement is changing. So I really appreciate someone who uh, identified that. Yeah. Um, a question for Vaishnavi. Um, trans ideologues in the West often point to the Hijra class of people in the Indian subcontinent as evidence that the third sex have always existed. Um, how would you respond to that? There is no third sex. <laughs> Does not exist. You know, this, this is exactly the issue that I try to bring out uh, with my writing and so through social media and everything. It's so convenient for the West to constantly hitchhike on the Hijra uh, community and say that this has predated, I don't know, human civilization or whatever. But, <laughs> but there are voices like mine, also from India, also being a, coming from the same culture and similarities and history and everything. Mine is not taken into consideration at all. When I'm saying I'm from India, I have seen people from the Hijra community. You are wrong about this. Stop hitchhiking on Hijra to justify giving puberty blockers to children. Stop doing it. It's, uh, it's definitely not the same. It's, it's, uh, the funny thing is, the West is doing it, and Indian social media is doing it too. You know, because we ape, apparently, everything that the US and the UK does, except when there is dis, uh, some sort of a resistance, and at that time, we're silenced. It's convenient for the West to pick, cherry pick these topics that are suitable to propagate their ideology further, but not the ones that are speaking in dissent, i.e. me. Thank you. Question for Derek. Given that no adult believes that Joe Biden really believes or understands gender identity ideology, <laughs> how was the presidency captured and who exactly is behind this? It's a great question because I wonder how Rachel Levine came to be in this position. I think she was elevated above her merit um, and she, you know, 
she's maybe a little bit incompetent and a little bit just an insane ideologue. Uh, but either way, she sucks at her job. And why they put her there, I don't, I don't know. I think that it flatters the identity politics and the um, self-concept of, of Democrats to promote her, and they're not paying enough attention. Um, so, you know, the sort of leading voice uh, on gay issues in the administration is a gay man named Pete Buttigieg, who's our Secretary of Transportation. Um, I think if anyone can reform Biden on this issue, it has to be Buttigieg. Um, and he has presidential aspirations of his own. So um, my hope is that he will see the, the need for reform here um, because if we don't right the ship, then Democrats will become unelectable. Thank you. I'd like to ask Fika, how do we campaign for the repeal of bad gender identity legislation and at the same time campaign for genuinely, genuinely progressive gay rights legislation around the world? Well, here's I, how I do we do I'd it. I give her a really easy question. <laughs> um, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm not, I, I don't have an answer, but I know, I know a bit about how we got here, um, how we are, where we are. I, I worked in the LGBTIQ context for a long time, and also with um, organizations um, such as IGLIO when I was young and with ILGA in Europe um, 10 years ago. So um, there are strategies, of course, to get legislation passed, and there is um, strategic litigation, there is funding, uh, there are funding priorities, and I think that we have to be very well aware of all of this and um, see what we can use and also what we can make transparent. Because a lot of people, they don't know about this. They, the, the politicians also, they don't know that they are being acted uh, upon strategically by advocacy groups, by lobby groups. And what we need is to balance this out. Um, I, I would not say to take over, but really to balance it out so that politicians can make informed decisions, what they can actually be informed. And so what I really enjoyed seeing is when I walked through here, you have uh, um, stalls of different organizations and associations that have been uh, founded with different focus areas run by, by parents focusing on prisons, focusing on, on, on different topics. And that is very important and necessary because in Austria at the moment, even if we would want to get um, balanced information about this topic and a statement from an association that disagrees, there is none. There is none. There is no association. There are no individuals that would want to put out a statement publicly in their own name. So we really need to have these, these groups, these, these um, ad ad additions to the discussion so that it can be actually a complete discussion and all views are present and, and represented. Thank you so much. Um, I got a question that I can't ask any of our panelists, which is why is Stonewall not highlighting these international cases of homophobia? Why has Stonewall forgotten about international LGBT rights? I'm not going to ask anybody that. I'm going to um, round up here. I want to say how incredibly thrilled I am to have been able to, to have had the privilege of chairing this panel of, of these four amazing individuals who are pursuing such very different struggles around the world. Let this be the beginning of an international conversation that we will want to continue every year and uh, actually much more frequently. Thank you very much. Thank you.